Good evening. So tonight I'm going to share some stories with you about the children that I've had the privilege of spending the last 25 years of my professional career with. Uh, these stories will illustrate the lessons that they taught me about the difference between the adult I thought I should be and the adult that they needed me to be. So the year was 1992. I had just graduated from the University of Vermont. I was a brand new teacher. And I began to look for teacher jobs, but there wasn't any. Uh, so I, like any brand new college graduate, started to cast my net out wider and went to the local child care center that had just been built and put in my application uh, to be anything. <laughs> If any of you have recent college graduates, you know there comes a point where you're like, whatever, I'll take it. Um, so I was standing there handing in my resume, and they said, wait, we want to interview you right now. Uh, I was interviewed, and I was hired immediately. And the job that they gave me was as a teacher of infants. And I thought, I don't know anything about infants, but they're infants. How hard can that be? Oops. Well, I quickly learned how hard a group of 12 infants could be. And when I tell you that they are probably the toughest audience on the face of the earth, you'll just have to believe me. Uh, I spent two years working with infants, and they taught me a, a variety of amazing lessons. They taught me that um, I needed to, to unbusy myself. In the words of Magda Gerber, I needed to take the time to stop being so busy. I, there was always something more to clean. There were always toys to be picked up. There was always somebody who needed something. But that's not what these infants needed from me. What they needed was an attentive adult who was going to lay on the floor and watch them and talk with them and reflect back to them the things that they were making sense of in their world. Oops, sorry. They also taught me that I needed to be completely honest and authentic. Now, you are all thinking, honest with an infant? What are you talking about? Well, this is a picture of Silas. Uh, Silas started at the child care center when he was six weeks old. And Silas spent the first three weeks of his life in child care crying. Uh, so, like any brand new teacher, I thought, what am I going to do for this child who's just screaming at me all day long? I strapped him to my body, and I began to bond with Silas. I would talk to Silas. I would sing to Silas. We would walk around. And eventually, he would get tired and start to fall asleep. And I would go in and try to put him down in the crib very carefully, very gently, and then sneak away from him. And he would, like most infants, immediately detect the change, wake up, and cry. And he would actually get more upset because he had just caught me trying to sneak away. So I thought to myself, oh my goodness, Like after you know, a solid month of this child not sleeping at childcare, not only am I going crazy, he's going crazy, his parents are going crazy. I thought, why is he doing this? Why is this so consistent? And I started to understand that it wasn't that Silas hated sleep, because no human hates sleep. I mean, babies hate it a little more than adults do. Uh, but it was that I was sneaking away from him. I wasn't being honest about what I was doing. And so when I took the time to change how I was discussing this experience with Silas, and I would still walk him around until he was ready, and I would say, you're my guy. Please don't cry. I had a whole little rhyme song that I made up for him. As I would go to lay him down in his crib, I would say, Silas, I'm laying you down in your crib. You're going to have a nap. But when you wake up, I'll be right here to get you. And that changed the entire dynamic for him. I was telling him what I was doing. I was being honest. I was showing him that I was trustworthy. The final lesson that the infants taught me was that my plans weren't their plans. I might have a plan to serve snack at 10 o'clock. If they didn't feel like eating snack at 10 o'clock, I would have the snack thrown back at me at 10 o'clock. Um, I needed to figure out that they all had their own internal rhythms, which were absolutely valid and important, and that that internal rhythm didn't necessarily have anything to do with what I thought about time and space and <laughs> play. 
So I spent two years, two solid years with these infants, and I uh, enjoyed them a great deal. Here you can see the uh, infamous do not try to make a toddler walk any faster than a toddler feels like walking, because they can actually reverse time with the slowness of their walking when you, they are not in, into what you're doing. And also, if you believe that this, the tissues are simply for blowing your nose, you will always have one child who will find something very unique to do with the tissues. So after two years, I moved uh, to a different state to be with my then fiance. And I was hired as a uh, four-year-old teacher. And I thought, I'm going to be a real teacher now. All of the lessons from the infants had immediately dropped out of my head. And I thought, oh, I'm a teacher. I know, how to do, I know how to do teaching. I know how to be a teacher. I'd had four years of teacher training. I was ready to be a teacher. So I uh, was given, I uh, walked into my classroom, and there I was. I was the uh, teacher, lead teacher of 18 children, 14 of whom were four-year-old boys. I'll just give you a moment to kind of picture that in your mind. 14 boys, four-year-olds looking at me. And um, because I knew what to do as a teacher, the first thing that I did was to make rules. This isn't uncommon. It happens every September in every classroom across the United States. Rules are made. And the rules that I chose weren't particularly radical. They probably are still in existence in most classrooms today. And those three rules were um, keep your hands to yourself, self-explanatory, no toys from home, and no guns, no violent play. Now, I had great adult reasons for all of these rules. I didn't want to deal with toys from home because toys from home get broken, they get lost, and they get fought over. I didn't want to deal with the messiness of the fighting over toys from home. So if I just excluded them, that would take care of that. Keep your hands to yourself. I didn't want them to grab each other, to invade each other's personal space, to uh, do all of the things that we know actually developmentally that children are doing with their bodies, which is to put them on other humans and things and objects constantly. And I didn't want the boys to wrestle and get hurt. And I thought, oh, just keep your hands to yourself. And finally, of course, I believed or worried that allowing the boys to play guns, um, I, this was during the Power Ranger era, so there was a great deal of faux karate chopping going on in my classroom constantly. Um, that gave way to Ninja Turtles, where there were also karate choppings, but swords were added. So I was hoping that this was not going to encourage violence. In, uh, for these children. I didn't want them to become violent because I had a very adult fear of guns and violence and what that meant. And I thought if I could just ban it, it wasn't going to happen. Well, the first inkling that my rules were not rules that the boys were going to be able to follow came uh, at Circle Rug every morning. I had a circle rug. We gathered to Circle Rug. We did our songs and calendar. Well, I began to believe that circle rug was puppy pile time. It was like all of them would glom onto one another and roll about. They weren't fighting, they weren't being malicious, but they had a real need to be on top of one another. And so every day I would spend 10 minutes unpacking all of my little wolf cubs from the wolf pack because that's how I started to think of them. It's my little wolf pack and I was the mother wolf kind of guiding them from thing to thing. And I thought, how come they can't keep their hands to themselves? Hmm. My second inkling came when um, I watched Sammy walk into the class one day. Now, Sammy lived about two blocks from the childcare, and he walked every morning with his dad. Uh, and he walked into the classroom, and he was, he had this kind of strange, stilted walk that he kind of made his way over to his cubby. And I thought, hmm, that's unusual. So I called Sam's dad over and I said, is Sam OK? And Sam's dad kind of looked at him and said, hey, Sammy, come over here. So Sammy walked over to us. And then he said, hey, buddy, are you OK? <laughs> and Sammy, very shyly, kind of looked down and produced not one, 
but two tigers from his underwear. He had just walked two blocks with two toy tigers in his underwear because he wanted to play with toys from home. His play that was a uh, play that he was enjoying and wanted to share with his peers, the only way he could achieve um, showing his peers something that he loved was to smuggle the tigers in his underwear. And I thought, I don't think this is a very good rule either. The final epiphany that I had about the fact that my rules might not be so great was uh, during uh, an afternoon in which the boys were over at a, a table, they were playing with manipulatives, and they were engaged in an incredibly rich, cooperative, collaborative learning experience, the kind of thing that early childhood teachers we know are what we want for our children. And I heard them talking, and they were building guns. There was a lot of talk about the gun, what they were going to do with the gun. They, they had it all out. Can you hand me that piece from a gun? It was, it was a beautiful play, except it was about guns. And there were to be no guns in my classroom. So I stood up. And I, as I started to stride towards the boys, they froze because they knew. They knew what I was coming over to do. And I walked over, and I said, gentlemen, what are you building? And they were silent. And then one of them, no, nobody would meet my eyes. No one would look at me. We, we all knew what was going on. One of them, without looking up, said, we're building snowblowers? <laughs> to which the other three said, yeah, yeah, we're building snowblowers. And I thought, I don't know, you're not blowing some snow blowing. You're blowing snow at me, my friends. Um, and I thought, okay. So I didn't want to call them out for the lie immediately. So I went, okay, but they're not guns, right? No, no, Dawn, they're snow blowers. And at that moment, I understood that they were lying to me, that by my accepting the lie, and repeating it back to them that I was then lying to them, and we were now engaged in this circle of lying. That was not the kind of teacher that I wanted to be. That was not the kind of teacher that the infants had taught me that they needed. The boys, in order to sustain a play that I now know that they needed to have, um, had to lie to their teacher to be able to continue to play. Gunplay is not what adults believe it to be about. It is about power and powerlessness. And what the boys were asking for was not a ban on guns, nor were they asking to actually go out and shoot people. They were asking for adult help to mediate all of the stuff of the world that they're trying to figure out. They didn't want to be left on their own, but I was forcing them to be left on their own by not participating with them and negotiating with them. So my wolf packs, each one of them, <coughs> taught me that I had to earn the trust and respect of each member of the group. It wasn't enough that I was tall. It wasn't enough that I was older. That didn't automatically give me respect. Connection between adults and a special child, or uh, between children and a special adult, is a rare and priceless gift. The trust that I wanted to build was not going to be achieved through the enforcement of adult rules that I had decided were important to me, but that the children were telling me through their conversations, their choices, their play, the rules that they needed. My role as their pack leader meant that my wolf packs demanded that I make decisions that weren't just convenient for me or made me feel good. It meant that I had to, dis to consider the needs of each individual as a member of the group, not just even the group, each individual member of the group. All of these children that I've had the pleasure of knowing and loving have taught me that there can be no learning without trust. I strive every day to be an authentic and trustworthy adult. And I challenge you to be that sort of adult, too. Thank you. <laughs>